So, welcome to the second half of the Connecting Cities Conference. Uh, we have to start right now, although uh, it seems a lot of people, a lot of the audience still at lunch. So, um, but nevertheless, thank you for coming. Uh, we will start right now with the keynote, keynote by Dietmar Offenhuber. Uh, he has a PhD from MIT in urban planning, and he is now a professor at uh, Northwestern, uh, Northeastern University in Boston. So let's welcome Diet Dietmar Offenhuber. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. Okay. Yeah, um, I hope you're all digesting the lunch well, and I hope what I'm going to uh, present is not too hard to digest. So uh, I'm going to start with a slide that is a, um, a still from what is maybe the first movie about a smart city, uh, Sherlock Goudard's uh, Alphaville. And, uh, you know, I mean, smart city in the sense that we have uh, a city that is intelligent, that controls all the infrastructure, and uh, according to principles of reason and uh, rationality. Uh, until this gentleman, Eddie Constantine, uh, takes everything down. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, when Alphaville was made in the early 60s, this idea of the city as an intelligent being was not new. It was already a familiar science fiction cliché. So, and maybe that's why it made it into the film, because the film plays with these kind of uh, pulp, pulp fiction uh, kind of uh, images. Um, but one could argue that while the city in Alphaville is um, intelligent, after all, it, it leads this kind of philosophical discussions with uh, our uh, uh, protagonist, it is not very smart. Uh, it, Smartness doesn't really require this kind of human-like intelligence. Smartness just needs, uh, you know, recognizing patterns in what happens, analyzing it, predicting, and acting on these predictions without making a big fuss about it. Yeah? So in a very invisible, unobtrusive kind of way. The reason why I brought up this slide is because um, Sholok Goudard initially wanted to call his movie Tarzan versus IBM. And this is an interesting coincidence because during the past five years, uh, IBM was perhaps the company that really promoted this label of the smart city as a comprehensive solution that is sold to municipalities. Um, and again, the idea is that you have uh, sensors on infrastructure, you uh, have all this information, you make the, uh, the infrastructure more efficient, water, sanitation, mobility, and all those services. And in a way, this idea of the smart city with sensors, infrastructure, and this kind of one company basically covering all those things uh, is pretty much a closed chapter. And I don't say this because I don't believe in it. Uh, I say this because even IBM has given up on this idea. The Smart City project is no, real, uh, no longer really high on their agenda. Um, and uh, they have moved on to, to data analytics and other services. Maybe they have realized that these kind of cash-strapped cities are not really the best customers for them. Um, after the recession, there was this big hope that uh, there's going to be a big uh, infrastructure investment uh, after 2009, but this hasn't quite material, materialized in the same way as was anticipated. But one could say definitely not only because of this kind of uh, internal politics of IBM, uh, but that the smart city also has a kind of a reputation problem. Uh, it doesn't really have a very good uh, uh, reputation, and there are many different critiques, uh, starting from privacy to gloating over the fact that nowadays even trash bins can crash and produce these kind of core dumps. Um, and, you know, I think there are more papers uh, that criticize the concept of the smart city than those who promote the concept of the smart city. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I have to ask myself, uh, you know, is it really such a bad thing if you want to e make infrastructure more, you know, efficient, uh, especially now that, that infrastructure is, is actually a, a real problem? 
and, or asking the other way around, what is, what is the alternative to this kind of uh, totalitarian idea of the smart city? So since uh, 2011, we had this series of uh, uh, symposia and, and book, book publications under the uh, name Sensing Place, Placing Sense. Uh, this uh, was from our first uh, instance of this uh, symposium right here at Ars Electronica. And this is a, a picture of Peter Franken uh, from SafeCast, who uh, tried to start uh, radioactive measurements after the earthquake in, in Japan and uh, all Geiger counters were sold out, so he couldn't get one, so he built one himself uh, and attached it to his iPhone uh, to also be able to have this kind of uh, mobile readings of, of radioactivity in the area. And uh, in the end, he, he basically uncovered also um, yeah, measurement or methodological mistakes in the official way of um, measuring radioactivity so it was, was a very successful project in many different ways. Uh, Peter Franken could be called uh, uh, an example of an expert amateur. Yeah, he's someone who has an expertise in a field who really cares about a particular topic. Uh, and he, he builds, he does something, he builds this technology and basically creates a, also a template that other people can follow. And this is in many ways today and also of this uh, conference and tomorrow, uh, there's all this talk about the smart citizen as the alternative to the smart city. And of course, there's, it's in a way a very uh, you know, engaging proposition. Uh, we, we talk about uh, individual uh, activism uh, versus this kind of corporate uh, uh, you know, urban uh, infrastructure approach. Uh, we talk about, um, yeah, um, participation versus this kind of invisible notion of infrastructure and so you know all of that is all of that is great um, and um, also the cities have realized uh, under the label civic technologies that uh, this is a, a concept that works very well uh, this is an ad for citizen connect which is a uh, example of one of these popular uh, citizen incident report apps in Boston that is operational since 2009 was one of the first one and now there's five years worth of data uh, and um, you know it's, it's about the city promote this idea uh, because this is also a way of engaging the, the citizens in the idea of a public good yeah so um, <clears throat> this idea of a new uh, value for for civicness and of course, the data is actually very valuable. Uh, so this is a, a, a map of, in this case, from New York, from uh, citizen complaints that I mapped. I basically just picked out uh, three random complaints from the top 10 uh, about litter, about graffiti, and about noise. And uh, so I don't know how many millions reports those are. I, I kind of compiled it. But um, it, you see that immediately you have all these patterns. Yeah. Uh, although it's not always clear what those patterns mean, but you see that, you know, noise complaints are in Manhattan, uh, s um, concentrated. Graffiti complaints are very localized in specific areas. Um, litter and trash and uh, sanitary issues are mostly in these kind of suburban neighborhoods. Uh, if you look a little bit closer at Manhattan, uh, it's, it's not very clear whether right at this kind of border between uh, Harlem and uh, Midtown uh, and at the Upper East and Upper West Side whether noise suddenly stops or whether people don't complain about it anymore. So, you know, we, we see all these patterns and those, uh, this information is very valuable uh, also, for, also for companies because they don't have to uh, put these sensors into concrete anymore to, and, and recharge batteries and deal with hardware failures. All they have to do is offer analytic services, uh, which is also uh, a very good uh, economic proposition. So, in a way, this this idea of uh, the smart citizen almost sounds a little bit too good to be true. So the political left likes it because it focuses on uh, societal and communal values. The conservatives like it because it uh, emphasizes uh, the responsibility of the individual. Uh, so, you know, uh, companies like it, the cities like it, so where is the catch? 
And I think it is in fact uh, in the way how we use the word participation. You know, there's, it's a kind of, there, uh, it's a word that glosses over many contradictions and many different interests uh, that, you know, are the manifest, are these different manifestations of, of what constitutes participation. And uh, so Sherry Arnstein, this uh, American uh, political scientist, wrote in the 60s uh, about this observation that apparently everyone likes participation. You know, there's, you never hear this term in a kind of a negative connotation. Uh, it's, it's always great. And she said, somewhat sarcastically, that the idea of citizen participation is a little bit like eating spinach. No one is against it in principle because it is good for you. So we see there's this kind of uh, paternalistic uh, aspect to it. And what she continued on arguing is that uh, we only say that participation is good until we really have to talk about uh, separation and distribution of power. So when, when someone uh, not only participates but also can decide, then suddenly the um, uh, enthusiasm uh, quickly goes away. And uh, so she proposed, instead of talking about participation, looking at all those different uh, kinds of engagement, uh, depending on how much decision power and influence power the individual actually has. So she talked about this ladder of citizen particip participation that starts with you know, participation as a kind of manipulation, as a pseudo-participation, uh, to, on the other end, citizen control, where the citizens are in charge. And I think it's a, it's a good exercise to do the same thing uh, when we look at the different manifestations of civic technologies that we see at the moment. You know, uh, instead of talking about the value of participation, let's, let's look at what, it, what actually uh, in, is entailed with these different forms of participation. And if we try to uh, develop a similar ladder, uh, we, we see that on the lower end of the ladder, um, where um, participation is, is, is basically uh, pseudo-participation. We see that very often in crowdsourcing or uh, gamification and nudging and all those kind of uh, contemporary forms of behavior engineering, uh, participation is a way of manufacturing compliance. And, you know, gamification is this idea that you use uh, game mechanics to motivate people to do something which they probably wouldn't do otherwise, you know, recycling, collecting uh, uh, aluminum cans. Uh, nudging is a little bit more aggressive. It's kind of like poking people and say, have you walked your 10,000 steps today already? Um, so, of course, you know, there, there's certainly some ways where this uh, works, but uh, we have to say that Gamification is, not a, is about succeeding at the rules, it's not really about uh, questioning the rules. So we have the designer who already knows what is good for us and, and we have to comply. Uh, so we have to ask the question, what does it mean if an aluminum company like Alcoa uh, puts out a, a recycling app where uh, the people who buy uh, aluminum cans or like Coca-Cola and those kind of things uh, are through gamification uh, motivated for recycling these cans and get points the more cans they recycle. Uh, I'll talk about those kind of things uh, a little bit later, but let's move on to the second uh, level, participation as feedback or as consultation, where the citizens are a source of information, not just kind of comply with the you know, intent of the designer. And here, of course, we have all those kind of citizen feedback apps. And I think right at this moment, I think almost every larger city in the kind of Western world, but also in many developing countries, have such an um, uh, incident reporting system. Uh, they, are all, they all more or less do the same thing. You can take a photo of you know, a pothole or a broken street lamp, and you submit it, and you get a response back from the city, or maybe not. And, uh, I'm interested in these kind of design differences between those to understand how the design mediates this kind of conversation or kind of also shapes the conversation, but that's a different topic. Um, also, of course, also Linz has one of these. Uh, it's called Schau auf Linz, and there's a website, a public website, where all those complaints are uh, publicized, and you can read them, what people complain about, and you can reply, and you can do certain things. 
And uh, you know, you could say this is a form of digital public space. Um, but unfortunately, the digital public space is not the same thing as physical public space, uh, because by definition, physical public space sometimes forces us to deal with things that we would rather not like to deal with. This is how also Jane Jacobs and, and Richard Sennett defined public space. So I decided in a project uh, that I uh, did for um, the Ars Electronica Future Lab in Connecting Cities uh, this April, and which uh, we will show tomorrow at the Ars Electronica Center, to uh, not only make them visible in physical space, but also let people hear them in pu public space. So I'm, um, I have this kind of system for the facade that basically reads those complaints through the loudspeakers that are in the facade to the people who walk by. And Auf I, einem Parkplatz yeah, sind die Überreste eines Kraftrades deponiert. Auch wenn es motorisch noch funktionstüchtig wäre, ohne Sitzbank scheint es doch nur sehr ungeeignet fahrbereit. Angemeldet ist der Schrotthaufen noch. Sollte es ein Parkplatz einer Genossenschaft sein, konnte ich im Vorbeifahren nicht als solches erkennen. Bitte um Weiterleitung an die Polizei. So I have to say that, uh, you know, Linzers are really great at complaining. Uh, it's, those are really, uh, it was actually really funny uh, to have those kind of, you know, letters, very, you know, well-written letters to the city full of, you know, irony and, and sarcasm uh, read by this kind of unemotional computer voice. And, uh, um, I, you know, in a way, I, I really like this uh, kind of effect uh, on the public space. But, yeah, anyway, uh, there is a gradual uh, continuum between feedback and actually enforcing sanctions. So as long as uh, feedback doesn't produce anything, you know, there's not much you can do. But uh, the next level would be participation where it's actually about uh, also imposing some form of sanctions if, um, the, you know, this, where the citizens become watchdogs or um, uh, Schatzen talked about this kind of notion of the monitorial citizen. And of course, this kind of continuum is, is uh, goes from implemented forms where the cities directly enlist citizens to uh, monitor the quality of service that maybe an external company provides to the city to these kind of informal mechanisms where, the, uh, where it's all about uh, you know, public shaming and uh, uh, informal pressure. And uh, this was, uh, uh, there, there are also of course uh, early examples in the history, uh, this is uh, uh, Phil Brown uh, theorized this early on in the 80s uh, and talked about popular epidemiology, about this uh, kind of very fateful uh, events in Woburn, Massachusetts, where citizens drove the inves investigation of a, a toxic uh, uh, pollution incident that uh, caused many lives and against the pressure of all kinds of other uh, political actors and uh, was uh, a very iconic case. Also, you see it was also uh, made into a film with John Travolta. And uh, Phil Brown coined this term popular epidemiology. And he looked very closely, what is the difference uh, if scientists uh, conduct this kind of research versus when citizens uh, drive this research? So, you know, they are kind of good and bad sides about it. It was, was very interesting. Uh, but the reason I bring this up is because seven, uh, 10 years later, he wrote a response to his own paper and kind of reframed this once again, and now he called it citizen science. Uh, and this is, of course, this kind of citizen science or grassroots science is also right now a very uh, a popular field. Uh, one year after Sensing Place, we had a second instance where we talk, talked about accountability technologies, uh, where we looked at projects that not only made a statement or a prototype or a demo, but actually tried to change something. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, a public lab in New York, Brooklyn. They uh, create this kind of balloon mapping uh, applications, also in the kind of uh, yeah, pollution monitoring. Um, so the next level would be participation as co-production, as uh, Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, called it where now we have a case where citizens and uh, the city government work together to provide services and maintain infrastructure. Uh, this can work very well when we talk about uh, incorporating 
local knowledge and assessing the needs from the people who actually receive these services, it may not work as well if we only talk about this as a way of, of saving money. Uh, so tomorrow, in our, uh, on Saturday, in our uh, third instance of Sensing Place here at, at Post City, uh, we look at these cases of improvisation in infrastructure maintenance, you know, how is kind of this cult cultural um, dimension of infrastructure services and, and we make this argument that uh, we is uh, uh, myself and Katja Schechtner, uh, my colleague who I'm curating this with, um, we call this infrastructure because we make this argument that improvisation is not only in developing countries but also um, everywhere or in general a necessary element of all kinds of infrastructural practices. And there's a, a design ethnography that we worked on over the summer uh, looking at uh, public street light provision in uh, Manila uh, where there, there are a large number of different social practices, how people provide light and how uh, people also may, uh, repair lights, street lights, and modify and reappropriate them and use them as tools for selling things and all kinds of things. So it's a very uh, complex and interesting uh, environment where, where many of these kind of co-production processes happen. But then finally, as the last point, uh, the kind of the holy grail of the techno-libertarian, uh, this kind of idea of the uh, self, completely self-organized bottom-up infrastructure that is built and maintained by its users, uh, the inverse infrastructure. And uh, of course the question is, you know, can something like that work? Uh, everyone says yes, of course, we have Wikipedia, uh, but then except Wikipedia, are there other examples? Uh, and one great example that I always liked uh, is uh, a project by media artist Usman Haag uh, back in uh, 2008, I think, or seven it started. Um, uh, Patch Bay, which is a, a platform where individuals can share their um, sensor feeds from their own devices and, and make them available to others. So in a way, they are um, realizing this original promise of what the smart city was supposed to be uh, in a very direct way and, and it was very impressive and worked really well. And uh, consequently, Ed Borden, uh, one of the employees, made this statement on the Patch Bake blog in June of 2011 where it says, big government has become irrelevant in the public sector, eclipsed by someone with a supercomputer in their pockets, open source hardware and software at the fingertips and a global community of like-minded geniuses at their back and call you, you are the smart city. Um, a little bit further down on the same page, uh, Adam Greenfield uh, replied basically not so fast. Uh, there are some things that can only be accomplished at scale. For better or worse, governments are among the few actors capable of operating at the necessary scale to accomplish things like that. They're certainly the only ones that are, even in principle, fully democratically accountable. And uh, ironically, or uh, he was he was right uh, very uh, because two or three weeks later, Patch Bay was uh, sold and converted into a closed commercial service. Uh, it, it still operates and works, but it's no longer this kind of uh, community of uh, self-driven um, uh, volunteers. And that really tells us something about this kind of a dilemma of all kinds of infrastructural practices. So we have this fascinating energy of this you know, creative community who builds up this, this system, uh, but it's very difficult to maintain it and expectations of infrastructure are actually different. We, we think about reliability and uh, you know, accountability and uh, um, yeah, uh, all these other qualities. So to conclude, what is wrong uh, with this uh, notion of participatory infrastructure. Uh, and I'm talking not about the ambition, but I'm talking about the rhetorics of, of participation. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there's this issue of incrementalism. Uh, of course, it's always, uh, you know, great to say, you know, save the world one step at a time. Uh, you know, everyone contributes something and then uh, if everyone would recycle, uh, or if everyone would collect this kind of uh, uh, Coke cans and recycle them, then uh, we, our environment would be in much better shape. Uh, but at the same time, you know, 
there are also systemic issues that are kind of distracted uh, from this kind of focus on the individual responsibility. Uh, you know, the kind of beverage companies, manufacturers could also change something in their kind of design processes. And Samantha McBride, she, she said this actually about recycling, but I think it can be said exactly in the same way about uh, civic technologies. She says that those kind of uh, efforts create a kind of busyness. And this busyness is a, is a handy method of maintaining the status quo, yet it is sim simultaneously active, optimistic, and makes people feel better. So this kind of one step at a time is also a way of, of actually staying in place. Uh, closely connected is this issue of uh, individualization of responsibility. You know, we have, you know, separate more trash today, unplug a device and do all of that. Uh, again, you know, the, the responsibility is, is shifted uh, to the individual and that is actually a deliberate uh, rhetoric strategy that was employed, uh, at least in the US, since the 60s to pr promote recycling as a method of, uh, you know, preventing this kind of mandatory measures where companies would directly be forced to pay for, uh, you know, uh, waste management uh, um, uh, processes. Uh, Samantha McBride wrote about this in her book uh, very convincingly. Uh, and the third, third point is that participation is not always something positive, it can also be a really a burden. And this poster that we see here is targeted at this policy initiative um, by the um, um, uh, British Prime Minister, uh, which he uh, promoted under the term the big society. Yeah? And big society was all about uh, engaging people, was all about uh, promoting volunteerism, while at the same time cutting back on, on, on public services. And that was, in a way, this, this uh, criticism that, you know, this kind of participation requires this kind of public uh, funding. It's not, it's not an e uh, either-or question. So, what is an alternative term uh, instead of participation? Uh, is there a better word? Uh, of course, I mean, another very uh, fashionable word is the commons, uh, but I think all those examples that I brought uh, could be better uh, understood in the, under the perspective of the commons, which is more, comes more from an economic perspective. Uh, uh, Eleanor Ostrom talked about governance of the common. It doesn't focus on psychological issues, on the motivations of the individual, but rather on these kind of shared issues that make a system work. And it implies or involves conflict. Uh, it requires monitoring and enforcement. It's not just enough to motivate people. You also have to make sure uh, that, you know, uh, there are sanctions if, if uh, someone misuses the system. Uh, and this, re uh, this relationship between uh, governance and usage of a service requires this kind of constant re renegotiation. It's not a static arrangement, it always kind of con uh, constantly changes. Um, and of course the example are these kind of uh, irrigation systems in Nepal that you wrote extensively about that are built and maintained by the farmers around this kind of very scarce resource of water. And uh, where, where can we see this today? Uh, I find, uh, for example, the, uh, the way how Bitcoin works very interestingly and uh, a very interesting example of this algorithmic governance and very similar uh, to this kind of uh, idea of the commons where the miners verify each transaction and make it possible that the system works. And although the miners get compensated with Bitcoins, it's still uh, at the moment a labor of love. You know, they don't really make big money out of it. It's, uh, there are enthusiasts who are really uh, excited about this idea of an al alternative currency and uh, in a way they uh, put in more money than they actually get out at this point in time. There was a different time before. Uh, so it's pretty much what you could call an algorithmic uh, commons. Uh, but then the question is how does this actually come back to urban infrastructure? And one of the lead developers, Mike Hearn, uh, presented his idea of how the future of infrastructure driven by Bitcoin and the blo blockchain might work. And he wrote, oh, he, didn't, he said this uh, in, in London at the conference, uh, in this future scenario, the roads on which Chen is driving uh, will have also become autonomous actors doing trades with the car on TradeNet. TradeNet is this kind of bit-powered uh, infrastructure, Bitcoin-powered infrastructure. The cars can submit bids 
or the roads can submit bids to the car about, about, uh, about much, how much they are going to charge to use them. If she's in a hurry, Jen can choose a road that's a bit more expensive, but which will allow her to get into the city faster. Awesome, right? And if we think this through, this is a complete departure of the idea of uh, public infrastructure. Because now infrastructure from an economic perspective comes a 100% uh, private good, uh, where even each tiny consumption of this public good becomes, uh, or of this private good, uh, becomes uh, a transaction. And you have this kind of, in a way, perverse situation where you have an infrastructure that is, in a way, a commons, uh, that is where basically uh, volunteers put in effort and money to make this system work that drives something that other people in a kind of private good uh, arrangement uh, profit from. So uh, it's, it's, it's getting very complicated and Bitcoin is not really an easy system to understand. So uh, my argument, and this is my conclusion, I think we really have to think about how we can make those things not only visible but also negotiable. I'm interested in this notion of infrastructure legibility, uh, where, you know, of course you have all these crazy uh, uh, cell phone images uh, and, and movies about these kind of Chinese Bitcoin farms uh, that are these kind of makeshift uh, um, clusters of, of, of miners. Um, but it's very, it's, it's not only about understanding how the system technologically works, but also how the representation of the system, how the images that we make of the system again, shape how we use uh, the system, you know, and uh, the, that is for me the biggest problem with the smart city paradigm. Because the smart city, uh, there's this uh, company in Michigan that sells these uh, smart street lights that are currently installed uh, right at this time in, in the city of Detroit, and they look like this kind of 19th century street lamps, you know, they have this kind of old-fashioned uh, uh, cast iron look, but they're actually sensors that sense all kinds of things and uh, they're public announcements and you know they're all these kinds of things, but looking at this thing you don't see anything. Uh, and of course since it's in public space uh, there is no expectation of privacy, you know, I mean uh, privacy is made for the private sphere not for the public sphere, so we have to really think about how to, how to deal with this kind of you know life cycle of data that is collected, who gets the data, who controls and, and all of those things. Uh, and I think design is a very important uh, factor for and representation and visualization for all of those things. Thank you. And uh, on Saturday, if you want to join uh, Sensing Place, Placing Sense 3 uh, over there, uh, improvising infrastructure, we have three projects, uh, one um, by Mark Shepard, Julian Oliver, and Moritz Stefana. Uh, we also have actually someone from this building, uh, from the postal system, uh, Gerald Gregori, from uh, the postal service, because we were really interested in, you know, how this uh, infrastructural um, you know, uh, facility worked and how people had to make it work even when it was already outdated. Uh, and then uh, we're also going to talk about the Manila projects on streetlights and uh, social practices around the electric grid. Okay, thank you very much. Saturday at 2.30.